So, Jim and Marlene Horman own a 40-acre farm that resides in Hancock County. Uh, Jim has been working in agriculture and farming since he was 13, first picking strawberries and working for Cleman Brothers Farms as a hire hand. He attended the Ohio State University, where he earned a bachelor's in agriculture, two master's degrees in agriculture economics and business. He worked at OSU Extension for 25 years, where he specialized in agronomic plots, water quality, no-till, cover, cover crops, and established two research plots, as well as written many fact sheets. In 2016, Jim joined the NRCS as a National Soil Health Specialist for Ohio, Indiana, Pennsylvania, and Maryland, where he contributed to changes regarding NRCS practice standards. He also extensively studied slug and bull issues associated with long-term no-till and cover crops, and wrote uh, 10 NRCS fact sheets about them. Uh, beginning in October of 2019, Foreman Soil Health Services was established, and Jim continues to be an international speaker on no-till cover crops and soil health. So uh, let's give a warm welcome to Jim. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. It's kind of nice to get back in the saddle. I'll tell you what, 2019 was one of the worst years to establish a new business. Why was that? <laughs> March of 20th wiped out about 40% of my business. I can just tell you that. So it's nice to be able to get back out. I don't see too many masks. Um, that's great. Uh, hopefully that's all behind us. Okay. Uh, I took that time for the last two years because business was kind of down. And I've kind of gone back and almost went on a sabbatical, I guess, and really started gathering some more information. So even though I'm not supposed to talk about that, I'm going to sprinkle some of it in because I know as farmers you're all looking for ways to reduce nitrogen or to make nitrogen work more efficiently. And I've learned some things there that I think will help you. I heard some things about slugs, okay? Now, I have two PowerPoints, or well, a PowerPoint on slugs and bowls. And I have five fact sheets on slugs. So if any of you guys are having problems with slugs, talk to me afterwards and I can help you. I have close to guys 30 presentations on soil health, okay? I can talk for three days straight. Okay? <laughs> I, I do run out of wind, I will tell you that. The worst problem I've got is I've gained a little weight, okay, so i got to get back into it. But we're going to talk about soil ecology, nutrient recycling, okay, and uh, I'm going to probably skip some slides, so don't get excited, but uh, I see where the time's at, and we don't have that enough time to, to do all that. I don't think we have this in quite Somebody want to come over here and mess with this, and I'll just keep talking. <laughs> I know my slides. So what we're going to talk about a little bit, uh, and what I want to go into some... There we go. Now, now we're way too far. Sorry, I can't do better. Uh, we don't have this up. All right. So let me talk about something that I learned while we're going at because it's kind of extra. I've been talking, uh, I've been reading up about these humates. You guys know what humates are? They're about 90% of what we call soil organic matter. So imagine this. Imagine if I took like uh, 100 different animals and I took 1,000 different plants and just ground them all up, okay, and put them in the soil and let them sit there and decompose for a while. Now, how, what, what, what kind of element is that? The decomposition. I, that, I mean, you got skin, you got lungs, you got got all kinds of different parts, right? There's close to 100,000 compounds in the soil, guys. All right? And we're trying to figure out what these are. So we give them broad categories. One broad category is fulvic acid. Those are the lightweight ones, okay? The other broad category are the hum uh, humic acid. Those are the dark colored ones. And then right in the middle is the human, okay? So uh, the fulvic acid, real quick, just on that. What does fulvic acid do it for us? Uh, it's very lightweight. It speeds up uh, metabolic activity really fast, okay? 
So what it does is it takes all these elements that are in the soil, breaks them down, strips them down, grabs them, and moves them into the plant and keeps them in the plant, okay? And then until it finds something. These are the things that turn into enzymes. So it'll attach to a pro uh, protein. This is really going to increase your growth and it increases uh, your yields. Okay, so you should be using a little bit of these humates, the fulvic acid, all right? You can put just a pint per acre. Now, one of the things that it really moves into the plant is iron. And iron is used for what? Iron is the enzyme that forms chlorophyll, okay? It's a central element for chlorophyll. So if you can increase your chlorophyll content, now you're gonna be able to get your plant. I have been spraying tomatoes and uh, strawberries, and I'll tell you what, within sometimes minutes, within hours, you can see them just turn really dark green, okay? So that's one little key that I'll tell you, fulvic acid. Now, there's a bad part about this. We have a little bit of a problem in Lake Erie. When we get rain, what happens? These organic compounds wash out of the soil, and fulvic acid is kind of a light brown yellow. What does it do to the algae? increases its growth by 100 times, okay? So we need to keep it on the soil. That's number one. Let me talk about another one. That's the, hum uh, the humic acid. Those are the ones that are really dense. They're dark. They're really good for storage, especially for nitrogen. So if you're putting uh, uh, anhydrous ammonia on, uh, something like that, actually that's a little toxic to the plant. You're putting a great big, you're putting this salt on, you add just a little bit of humic acid to your, to your about 3% by volume. You add that to your fertilizer, it'll be less toxic to the plant, and it's also better for the microbes. They can use some of the sugars and that that's in there to help process that because almost all of our nutrients go through the microbes, okay? So really, we ought to be fertilizing the microbes, not the corn and soybeans. If we were smart, that's what we'd be doing. Now, last one I'll talk about, and then we'll start on this. That is the human. And why is the human so important? Because it has something called anionic, anionic exchange capacity. We always talk about cation exchange capacity, because that's the positive ones, okay? This one is good if you are putting on nitrate or phos phosphate, soluble reactive phosphorus. It ties it up. Okay? And it will keep it in the soil for 60 to 90 days. That's perfect, guys, because if you're putting on this fertilizer, especially if you're putting it on with the planter, about 60 to 90 days is when that plant's starting to bloom and when we're really starting to get our yield. And that's when you want to keep it there. It's plant available, but it'll keep it in the soil for 60 to 90 days. So you really ought to be looking at some of these units now, there's always a downside. And what's the problem? Unfortunately, the way we manufacture human is we get it from the nardite clay. It's a brown salt clay, and they use potassium hydroxide, which denatures it. And by that, I mean it takes out all these negative charges, and now it's only about 10 to 15 percent effective. You can get human, but you got to look for it. You got to get human that hasn't been denatured. You got to ask a lot of questions. Okay, so that's something brand new. I think it's going to be a way that we can help Lake Erie, all right? So that was a whole, about an hour talk that I've just kind of developed that I'm kind of giving the highlights of real quick, okay? Let's talk about these healthy soils versus sick soils. What's a healthy soil? Has a minimum of these things, live plants growing year-round. Why is that? Because those live plants supply the energy to feed the microbes, and then the microbes in, 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 uh, are going to, feed those, the, the plant itself. Healthy microbial populations, those microbes process 90% of the energy in the soil. Wherever you have a bare soil compared to a live plant, the live plant has 1,000 to 2,000 times more microbes. Why is that important to every one of you farmers here? Because each one of those microbes is a soluble bag of fertilizer, okay? You want to have healthy soils. You want to have the microbes reprocessing it so that you can get the growth. What do six soils have in common? They're compacted. They have poor soil structure, high bulk density, poor water infiltration, lower water holding capacity. They tend to be bare. 
They have very low soil organic matter. We have tremendous nutrient balances, okay? That's why we're really concentrating on soil health now, okay? We're trying to make it better. Here's a couple uh, things that I, I've learned. Uh, one thing we didn't talk about, I actually went back to school for environmental sciences. I worked on a PhD for about four or five years. Uh, I did that when I was about 40, 45. I will tell you, if you want to scare the heck out of a professor, go back to school when you're 45. <laughs> oh my gosh. Some of those guys, when I walk in, your student, you ought to see their eyes. Their eyes would get real big. They, they, they liked having me in class, they said, but Jim, they always said to me, you really slow us down with all your questions. So that was one of the problems, all right? So here's what's going on. Natural vegetation, we got everything's in green. We have steady state. We have an active pool, a slow pool, a passive pool of carbon. We've got good aggregates forming, and we have this continuous porosity. What happens once you start to till that soil? Everything goes red. We, we start to aerate it. We're burning up the organic matter. All of a sudden, uh, we get soil organic matter losses. Our soils get hard and dense. Okay. Now, when we go back to long-term no-till and cover crop, it takes about three to seven years to make this transition, but we can get it back into that green again. Okay. And that's what we're trying to do. That's the biggest problem we have in agriculture is we've degraded our soil so much that it takes us a couple years to get back. And as a farmer, that's hard to do because you've got to make a profit, right? And, it, and you, you can most of us afford to maybe take a little bit of a yield hit for a couple years? Now, maybe it's a little easier when the price is so high, but fertilizer's high too, okay? Well, that's what we're going to have to do if we want to get back into this. Now, these are some pictures that I made up. How many of you guys have ever seen a purple tractor? <laughs> I didn't. The lady that did this made it purple. I said I can make it work. Make it work. Uh, and you know why, why it's purple? Because I don't want to tick off anybody that has a green one or a red one, okay? So it's purple. <laughs> but look what's going on here. You have this uh, plant on a conventional tilled soil are only out there about one-third the time. That means that this tank of energy is only about one-third full. If you're planting corn and soybeans, how many months out of the year do you actually have a live root? The microbes depend on those live roots to give off. Those roots are giving off 40 to 60 percent of their glucose from that root to feed the microbes. It's got to be important, okay? Here where we're doing no-till on a cover crop, our goal should be to have something living and growing on the soil 12, 12 months out of the year. That's also going to protect it from soil erosion, okay? Now, I don't know if any of you guys seen this, but the latest research that came out said they're estimating that our losses across the whole United States was 56 trillion metric tons in the last 160 years. Okay? Let me put it into numbers that you can maybe understand. The average erosion rate in the United States is 7.6 tons. That's 15,400 pounds. Okay? If I have a 50 bushel soybean yield at 60 pounds, that's 3,000. On average, we're losing five pounds of topsoil for every one pound of soybeans that we produce. Is that sustainable? The answer is no. Okay. And I think we all understand that. Now, the numbers have come down a little bit. We are getting a little bit better, but it takes a little bit of time. We have, where we have conventional tillage, a small microbial population, where we're doing what I like to call the ecological farming, much larger microbial population, and that's going to help to feed our crops, okay? It's going to improve that whole soil. When we do conventional tillage, you'll notice that we get uh, a lot of these whirlwinds. Within the first five to ten minutes, there's this tremendous loss of carbon up into the atmosphere, okay? Over here, where we're doing the ecological uh, farming, notice what happens. We've got nitrogen and phosphorus now that don't have anything to attach to. Over here, we're tying up those nutrients, we're recycling them, and we're bringing them forward to the next crop, okay? So that's what we're trying to do with the ecological farming. When do we lose these nutrients? In the late winter, early spring, we get snow melt, we get the heavy rains, a lot of these nutrients end up being soluble, or some of them, like nitrogen, go right up into the atmosphere with denitrification. That's when we lose them. Over here with the ecological farming, 
for keeping them tied up. I'll do one more, uh, and this is, I don't have the slide on this, but you guys all have probably raised a little bit of corn, right? How much corn, how much carbon does it take per day to get 200 bushel corn? Can anybody tell me? Anybody ever asked you that before? It takes 100 pounds. Where does that carbon come from? Well, we always assumed it came from the atmosphere, but if you were to get 100 pounds of carbon from the atmosphere, how big of a volume area would you need? 32 cubic acres of air for every acre of corn. Is that reasonable? No. Where's the carbon coming from? Look at how the carbon is cycled. First of all, we're taking in carbon dioxide and we give off what? Oxygen with the leaves, right? What about the roots? Roots take in oxygen and they give off what? Carbon dioxide. Okay? It's different on the top versus the bottom. Look at the stomata on your corn. The stomata are underneath, okay? Now here's what's going on. In the soil, at night, the carbon dioxide levels go up. Typical levels of carbon dioxide in the soil are about 3,000 to maybe 10,000 parts per million. In the atmosphere, what, what's the level? About 400 to 410. Okay, so it's coming from the soil, but at night, it actually raises to 20 to 30,000 parts per million. Okay, this is all good. Now the bad news. What's our efficiency on photosynthesis? About 10 to 20 percent. Why? Because we don't have enough carbon. Carbon is the most limiting element in the soil. And think about what happens. As that carbon is, is being recycled, there's a lot of nutrients that generally would be attached to that. If you have a bare soil, think about this. If I go out and till it in the fall, and I don't, I have a bare soil in the spring, as soon as I till it, what happens to that carbon? It goes up into the atmosphere, and what happens to it? Trade winds take it, and what's the biggest sink or deposit of carbon in the world? Oceans, okay? And since I don't have that carbon, I'm not attaching to the phosphorus and the nitrogen. That nitrogen is setting in that soil. What happens when it rains? because we don't have the carbon, it all flows to our rivers and our streams, and where does that nitrogen and that phosphorus generally end up? The ocean. We have a broken carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus cycle, and it's all related to the fact that we need to have more of these plants in. Something we just learned here recently, it even has an effect on climate. We're finding out that most of the uh, 1930s, the drought, why did that last so long? because they tilled up the prairies, those plants had a lot of microbes on it. The microbes go up into the atmosphere, and that's how it rains. If you don't have live plants, what happens? You get a lot of moisture in, in there, and this ought to hit home. Do we get regular half-inch, one-inch rains anymore? No. Well, if you have a whole bunch of moisture in there, you don't have a way for it to come down, what happens? It comes down in two, three, four, five inch rains rather than half inch rains. Just remember this, when you go to the tropics, get out your umbrella at about 3.30 to about 4 o'clock every day. Why is that? Because the microbes go up off of that through evapotranspiration. Every day they get about a quarter inch of rain, okay? So it's one of those things where this is worldwide. If we were doing a better job keeping our soils covered, we'd have a lot better rain fall and, and, and have a lot less of these problems. They're all related, okay? So this is what's happened to our organic matter levels. They've gone way down. We've lost 60 to 80 percent. Then we started to no-till and they came up some. Why didn't they come up more? Well, you got to restore that carbon. It's root turnover that restores your carbon, okay? And so if you don't, if you only have corn out there or soybeans, you're not going to be able to get it, and especially if you're tilling it, even if you're tilling it every other year, going to burn up a lot of that carbon, okay? So that's what's going on there. This just shows you the root mass. It all goes back to how you manage that. If you uh, keep everything very short, for example, your bonds, keep them really, really short, you're not going to get very much root mass, okay? But if you let them grow out a little bit, look, at, if I just let it grow out a couple uh, inches, I can get a lot more root mass. And again, you want to put more carbon in your soil, it's all about root turnover. 
It's okay to cut it. It's okay to graze it. But just don't overgraze it because overgrazing it's going to cause a lot of problems, okay? This shows you what's happening with no-till. The no-till is creating these macropores, uh, this ecological farming, and it's allowing these soil, when the water goes down, we used to talk about this saying, oh, no-till was bad on water quality. Actually, what it does is where we have a no-till system with a cover crop, it spreads that water out, and it allows that water to be filtered so we take the nitrogen, the phosphorus out, and now when the water comes out, it's actually clear at the bottom. Where we just have no-till, unfortunately, a lot of these nutrients are in the top couple inches, maybe one inch, two inch, three inches deep, and what will happen is about 30% of that phosphorus will run off the surface, get into our ditches, that's where you're losing your fulvic acid, and some of those, sometimes the, the humic acid, which is black, the fulvic acid is that yellow-brown, okay, we want to keep it in there, or what's happening is about 70% of it will go down this big macropore and then it gets right into the tile. 70% of the loss of our soil is through our tile. What we're doing here is we're spreading that water out through macropores, micropores, and biopores so that by the time it gets down to our tile, it's clear. Okay, so that's the natural cycle that we're trying to work in. I'm going to skip this. Come back to here. This one is uh, kind of important. No matter what you do, you're going to lose about anywhere from uh, 60 to 80 percent of that carbon is going to go up into the atmosphere. Okay? I used to think that that was a waste. Now I realize it's absolutely essential. One thing you guys don't really want to do, even though we talk about it, we use the term wrong, we don't want to sequester carbon, we want to recycle it. Okay? Just think about what they do in the greenhouse. In a greenhouse, they will raise that carbon dioxide level up considerably and they get more production. We don't really want to sequester it. We want to get it in the soil, obviously, but we want to turn it over. And we want to turn it over fast, okay? The faster we can turn that over. So about 3 to 8% of it goes into living, about 3 to 8% in these non humic compounds, that's the dead. And then the, the humic compounds that I was talking about, about 10 to 30 or 10 to 30% of it is in that very dead, okay? And that's the part that we're, we're trying to build a little bit more of this, and we're trying to build more of this. And, of course, this is kind of that intermediate where, where we're at, okay? So that, that's where we're at. I'm going to skip that. Once we're talking about active carbon, what's that active carbon? You'll hear that term. Those are those root exodus. So these are just the sugars and the glues kind of that that corn plant or soybean plant is going to give off. Why is that so important? This is what's limiting the most in our soil, is this active carbon. Why is that so important? Because if you want to have good soil structure, you've got to have those sugars and glues in there to make your soil clump together. What we don't want to dig in the soil and have a concrete block, okay? We want it to crumble. We want it to be like cottage cheese. Okay, and this is what does it. It's that active carbon. Okay, so that's what we're trying to get to. I'm going to skip this. We're going to skip a little bit of this. Um, nutrients in the soil. I did this slide two years ago, and this is the value of 1% soil organic matter in your soil. Two years ago, this number was 670. Why is it so high today? And, and you know, you'll look at these and say, well, but I just priced uh, ammonium uh, 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 and hydrous ammonium. It's 96 cents. I rounded it off to a dollar. Okay? So every 1% soil organic matter has 1,000 pounds of nitrogen in it. That's equal to about $1,000. The phosphorus, the potassium, and the sulfur, right around 100 pounds, give or take. Usually we got a little bit more phosphorus. We might have as much as 140 to 145, but I like to use round numbers. It just makes everything easier when you're doing the math. So you roughly got about $1,200 worth of nutrients every 1% organic matter. Okay? Now, how much of that recycles? And it's anywhere from 1% to 3% will recycle. If you have a healthy soil, you'll get a much higher return. Poor soils, the soils that have been really conventionally tilled, get about 1% uh, release. 
So if I have 2% organic matter, 1% of that's going to be about 20 pounds of nitrogen. Compare that to a soil where I have, say, 4 to 6% organic matter. Now I'm maybe getting 2 to 2.5%. Two Do the math on that, guys. That's 150 pounds of nitrogen. How many of you have ever taken a field and taken out a fence row? Okay. What happens when you take out that fence row? The corn's about this much taller. It's dark green. And it does what? What happens over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years? Corn starts shrinking and looking like the rest of the field. Okay. So that's what's going on there. We want to try to build that organic matter. This just shows you what you can do. How much how many pounds of nitrogen you can get out of that organic matter, depending on how healthy the soil is. The maximum would be around 3%. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do is build that up. I'm going to skip this. Uh, do we get more nitrogen from uh, inorganic fertilizer or organic? The inorganic fertilizer had significantly higher end losses, so that's your regular fertilizer. Organic just means that there's a carbon attached to it. Okay, so how much? 31% for fertilizer compared to 13% for the crop residue. That's how much the losses were. Uh, crop residue had 73% more retention of that nitrogen uh, that, than uh, the uh, uh, inorganic fertilizer. Okay, so what we're finding out is our plants really like to be spoon fed. They don't want too much nitrogen at one time. Okay, so let's go here and let's think about when I side dress nitrogen, how much nitrogen would you typically put on anybody if you're going to side dress your corn? 60. Six, side dressing, you guys are putting 60 pounds on? Okay, I have guys that put on quite a bit more than that, but we'll go with the 60. Uh, so if you're putting on, oh, I lost my train of thought, 60 pounds, but think about that. That plant, does it use all that nitrogen the day that you put it on? No, it wants it spread out, right? And so it's a little bit toxic. So one of the things you can do is, again, add your humates with that. And actually, what's even better is put a little sugar with it. Because why? The microbes need a carbon base in order to process them. What are they going to do with the sugar and the nitrogen? What are they going to form? Proteins. Okay, this is a biological system. So what you can do is add a little carbon with your nitrogen, and what we're finding out, you can either reduce your rates by 20 to 30 percent, or you can leave the rate up, and generally you'll get a higher yield. Now I don't know how much higher yield you might get, and that's probably up to debate on what else you do. Okay, and what other conditions you have in the soil, but we're finding out adding some carbon, and what you probably want is several different forms of carbon, sugars and carbohydrates. Things that are short, like table sugar, all the way to things like molasses, to maybe even some yeast or some things like that that are a little bit longer, and that way when the microbes start to break it down, they can Grab it, and the other thing it does is it buffers your soil. Okay, that's why you put the humates in there, the, the humic acid, it buffers the pH. These things are salts. Does everybody know what a salt is? A salt is a positive or mine, uh, negative uh, uh, molecule or anion, uh, uh, and what happens, element, and what happens is they draw water, they'll desiccate your plants. When you add the human, what happens to the humic acids uh, and the humates, it kind of buffers it and it, it doesn't make it quite as toxic. The other thing we've found out is putting too much nitrogen on, when you put it all on there, what happens? All of a sudden, it needs oxygen to break it down and it sucks all the oxygen out of the, of the water. Because what happens? Ammonia, think about it. NH4 is converted to what? NO3, I got to add oxygen in order to break it down into the nitrates. That's what the, the bacteria do. So now you get what? Anoxic lack of oxygen in your soil. And then what happens? Too much nitrogen 
whether it's in the nitrate form or the ammonia form, I have lists and lists of diseases that love those type of conditions. You're actually, yes, you're helping the plant by putting that nitrogen on, but a short term, you're actually hurting it with those anoxic conditions, okay? And so what are some ways you get around that and get increased efficiency on your fertilizer? Add a little sugar, add a little humates, about 3% by volume, it'll increase your investment in your dollar, okay? That's something I've just learned here within the last year, and I think that's something you guys all ought to be looking at. Your companies, all you guys, when you go there, they'll have products. The one thing I can't tell you is they probably all work, but some of them are a heck of a lot more expensive than the other ones, and most of the time the guys that are selling it to you don't really know what's in it, okay? Because anybody can really do this. You can just buy the things and do it. So it's a big trade secret of what's actually in there. They won't tell you. I'm sure some products are better than others. I just can't tell you which ones are. You're going to have to experiment yourself. Uh, I'm working with some, some groups to try to get that figured out. Okay? So that's what we're doing. Uh, common myth. Do inorganic fertilizers feed the plant directly? The answer is no. And here's what we found. Fertilizer derived in the nitrogen, in the corn, uh, if we put on 45 pounds, uh, about 25 pounds of it go, gets in there. If we put on 90 pounds, about 50 pounds get in there. And about 180 pounds of uh, nitrogen, about 78. Okay? That's what directly goes in there. Majority of it, over 50%, generally goes through the microbes first. Now, you've got to remember... This was done on a sandy loam soil. If we had a clay soil, these numbers would even be low, okay? But we're using the, uh, what, what we consider the best case scenario. So how much of that fertilizer is coming from the, uh, actually going into the plant? Those are those red numbers, 33% at 45, 38% at 90, and about 55 at 180, okay? So, uh, yes, the microbes are pretty important. This just shows as your fertilizer rate increases, your nitrogen use efficiency decreases. We need increasing amounts, increasing the amount of nitrogen uh, that is left over and enters the soil. So we're getting too much of it left over. That's part of the problem that we're having. And then that's subject to losses in the water and the atmosphere. I'm going to skip that. Let's talk a little bit about phosphorus just briefly. This is what happens uh, to phosphorus. And I can demonstrate that here real quickly. We've got about 15 minutes left, so I'm going to have to speed it up. These are bricks, so these are our clay particles. Would you do me a favor? Would you put your fist out there? <laughs> All right. I've got, a, I got a sponge. Yeah, a lot of trust there, isn't there? But that's your phosphorus, and it's the organic matter that really goes around there and keeps that phosphorus in place. Now, if I get rid of this and... We only have it attached to clay like that. Hold that fist up there. That's your soluble reactive phosphorus. Unfortunately, a lot of our phosphorus that's leaving is leaving with the soil particles. As long as we keep the organic matter in there, it'll stay tied up, okay? And it'll stay in the soil, okay? And, and this is a brick which is made out of clay, okay? We're going to use this a little bit later and do some demonstration. But you can see we have these clay phosphorus organic matter com complexes, and when we keep it complex like that, the phosphorus stays in the soil. Okay, when we open it up and we do a bunch of tillage, we get rid of that organic matter, then the phosphorus. I have some slides that show where we do vertical tillage. We get three times the loss of soluble reactive phosphorus going to Lake Erie, okay, than we do no-till. We get five times the rate of soil erosion where we do vertical tillage, okay, or, or uh, any kind of tillage for that. Okay? <laughs> the more aggressively you till, the worse it's going to be. One other little note, 96% of your microbes are within the top six inches of the soil. I know there's this thought that we have to bury these nutrients. I'm just telling you, Mother Nature doesn't work that way, okay? You don't have to bury them if you can keep them in the soil. And the only way you're going to do that is with organic matter. Okay? Mother Nature, you go out to the woods, what does she do? All the leaves, what's the highest level of phosphorus uh, in that soil? It's within that top one or two inches. She doesn't 
you know, they'll incorporate with worms and things like that, but most of our nutrients stay right up within that top six, uh, six inches. That's where most of your roots are. So I don't see the benefit of really trying to bury this. I actually did research on putting down phosphorus as, as deep as two feet, and we found out we got a 10 to 15% yield decrease, okay? Because what? Most of the roots are in that top six inches. That's where you want to have it. That's where you want to have your, your nutrients. Terminal uh, 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 tillage to the uh, microbes, it's, it's like heft. It's the worst hurricane, earthquake, forest, fire, tornado. Okay, what's going on? When you till that soil, only the smallest microbes are going to survive. That's your bacteria. Our soils are, ba are dominated by bacteria. What we really want to do is get this balance of fungus, good fungus. These are the mycorrhizal fungus. Mycorrhizal fungus are like hair extenders. They attach to the root and they extend out maybe 18 inches. Okay, and what they do is a root by itself can absorb one, or can explore one percent of the soil. When we have these root extenders out there, now I can explore 20 percent of the soil. And what these mycorrhizae will do is they bring back phosphorus, six times more phosphorus. They also bring back water and nitrates. And the biggest thing that they bring back are the micronutrients. Now that's another whole talk. I right? will just barely touch on this. If we look at carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, those are free, okay? Then, and then, oh, I'm sorry, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen are free. Then you got your nitrogen, your phosphorus, and your potassium. We've always said that 80% of your yield is determined by those three, so we spend a lot of time on that. We spend a little too much time now, guys, because that other 20% is what really starts to give us higher yields. You've got to have that balance of all those micronutrients because those micronutrients are the key to your enzymes. Enzymes are things that speed up the met uh, metabolic rate so that you can get higher yields. Okay, And that's why we've got to spend a little more time looking at how we can get these micro uh, micronutrients into the soil. Okay, Real quickly, this is what happens with uh, tillage. Uh, you're just burning it up. I'm going to just leave that. The worst is uh, the more you till it, the deeper you till it, the faster it burns up. This is research that has been done in Minnesota, and they show that the more you till it you do, the faster that carbon goes up. The best thing you can do on your farm, number one limiting element, is carbon. Get your carbon up. After carbon, probably look at how much N, P, and K you're putting on. Maybe cut back just a hair on those and take those, uh, that money and invest it a little bit more in the humates and the fulvic acid and then add in a little bit of the microbes. And we're finding out that we used to think that we could not uh, put on micronutrients. Uh, we had to put it in the soil. Unfortunately, we have the wrong soil conditions. The soil isn't in shape yet to take those micronutrients. They get tied up. So what's a better way of applying microbes? Boiler feed. Okay, now, I've heard this. I was in extension for 25 years. They probably want to chop my head off right now, okay? <laughs> I'm just telling you that if you get it in a very small, we're talking, we micronize it, and you put it in there, we're finding out. Let me ask you this question. You guys all use herbicides, don't you? Roundup. Have you ever looked at the, just look it up when you go on your phone. What's the chemical composition of Roundup? That has a huge chain on it, about like this, okay? And I'm talking about a single element like iron or zinc. And what you can do is, if you get that element reduced, and that's what the fulvic acid does, just a little bit, a pound per acre, you can put that fulvic acid in there, it'll reduce it, and it can get into those leaves and be absorbed very quickly. And then you will see almost instantly, I mean, I've watched leaves actually just sit there and watch them, and you can watch them turn color, okay? They will get a darker green, okay? One of the elements that is really hurting in our soils right now, nobody's talking about it, is iron. We have tons of iron. We got 43.43% iron in our soils. It's just in the wrong form. 
I look at soil tests all the time. It comes back very high in iron, very high in manganese. Problem is, it's in the wrong form. It's in the oxidized form. We want it in the reduced form. That's the way the plant uses it, okay? And we're seeing, especially with Roundup. Anybody here use Roundup? <laughs> sure you do. Maybe not as much this year, okay? But that Roundup is tying up zinc. It's tying up iron. It's tying up a lot of our micronutrients. And that's why we're not getting the yield potential that we should. I don't know about you, but soybeans yields have not really increased very much in the last 20, 30 years. Have they, guys? <coughs> micronutrients. That's hurting us. Okay? I'm just telling you. There's, there are guys that are getting 120, 150 bushel soybeans, and they're using some of the principles we're talking about. All right? Last thing on this while we're doing it. If you guys have a problem with Roundup right now, you really ought to look into this. I really don't have the time to talk about it. Actually, I'm getting way off hand here, but this is something that will help you. If you want to make your Roundup work better, be careful. I'm just telling you. Be real careful. You're going to have to experiment because there's not a lot of research on it. Use something called um, energized ROI water. Anybody heard of that? Anybody using it? What's energized ROI water? So I'm working with some guys that are putting on 10 ounces of Roundup where they were putting on 32. And they're using ionized ROI water. So ROI is reverse osmosis, okay? Nothing too crazy about that. You're just taking the iron and the calcium, and when you're putting that in your, in your spray tank, whether you're using it for nutrients or herbicides, that's in the oxidized form, and it's taking some of those, and it's, it's letting them pass through, okay? Now, what is the energized? There's this special valve that they put it through. It's got some metals in it, and what it does is, Instead of having H2O, now you've got H2O with two extra hydrogens, and you've got two hydroxyls. It splits that, that molecule. Now, anybody here, you guys all have sprayed a little bit. You want to make your sprays work better. Generally, what happens? Higher pH or lower pH makes your sprays work better? A little bit lower pH, right? So, it doesn't really change the pH because you still got the same amount of Hydrox you got hydroxyl on one side and you got the hydrogens on the other, but it acts like you lowered your pH. And when you spray it on your plant, it just absorbs in there like crazy. I've been using this a little bit on some tomato plants, and we're using energized water with a little bit of the, uh, the iron, and it's really making those plants just really, really uh, blossom. Okay? You can do the same thing on really about any crop. We're finding out that iron is really hard to come by in a cold, wet spring. Okay? We don't have that microbial population to make it available. Our corn should not be yellow. Some of that yellow that we're seeing, we all think it's nitrogen. Some of that's related to the nitrogen. Okay? Corn should be dark, dark green. And if you can get that corn, beans the same way, all of our crops, get them off to a really good start. Got to remember, corn makes its yield when? About V6. So between V2 and about V8 to V9, V10, that is a really critical time to get that plant off to a good start. If you can get it off to a good start, now you have maximum yield potential. If you wait till V10, most of us take tissue testing at V10. You've just lost a whole bunch of your yield because a lot of it's already been determined by that plant early on. Okay, so let's get into the microbes real quickly. I got about, I think, five or ten minutes. We started just a little bit late. This just shows you where the microbes are at. When we have the last frost, generally in the summer it gets really hot and dry. Microbes live on the water films. Okay, every time it rains, you're going to have this explosion of, of microbes. And then when we get into, uh, this was, I guess, early spring, early summer until it gets really hot. By late summer, they're coming down, first frost, and then they go down. Well, when those populations go down, we have a lot of dead bodies out there. 60% of the microbes are in a dormant. They live in, in dormant conditions. They really love to have these live roots out there. When you have the live roots out there, they're going to stay healthy. They're going to keep on expanding. So we can use this. Now, if I add, this was on a conventional tilled soil. If I add a cover crop in here and do no-till, 
this thing's going to raise way up here. And that's what we're trying to do is keep that microbial population. The other thing we do is with all that residue on the surface, it forms a blanket in the winter. Keeps that soil warmer in the winter, and in the summer it acts, it kind of keeps that soil a little bit cool. When the temperatures get too out of whack, we don't like it. I don't know about you, but in the winter I'm just like him. I always got uh, uh, a coat on or a sweater. I'm just a little bit cold. In the summer, oh my gosh, I'm hot all the time, sweating. Okay, I like a kind of a very narrow range. That's what your microbes like. They don't like it too hot. They don't like it too cold. And if you're comfortable, then they're going to reproduce a lot more. Okay? And just remember, every microbe is what? A soluble bag of fertilizer. Okay? So that's what we want to keep them happy. This just shows you what no-till does. We're going to skip through some of this. Just remember this, that there are anaerobic and aerobic. The aerobic likes the oxygen. The anaerobic uh, don't, uh, don't want uh, any oxygen, okay? <clears throat> Unfortunately, the anaerobic tend to be the ones that are pathogens, but they're also the ones that kind of help to get us, uh, our, our soil, to release some of the nutrients, okay? So here's the problem that we get into. We're finding out that reduced conditions, saturated soils, lack of oxygen, causes reduced elements. Almost all the nutrients that we need uh, have to be in a reduced form. That would be compacted areas. Did I just cross myself up? Do we want our soils to be compacted? Something I just learned here recently. I, this was a quandary. I was, I was, for about six months, I didn't know what to think, okay? Then I found out what you have to have is well aerated soils first. Well aerated soils do what? We're going to talk about this later. They form the microaggregates and the aggregates. So right here is a microaggregate. Inside that microaggregate, there's no oxygen. That's where these elements are being reduced. And then, since we have a well-aerated soils, I can get roots to come right down here, right next to this. What happens? These macroaggregates, microaggregates are breaking down, forming, breaking down, forming. When they break down, they're going to release all these micronutrients to this root growing right down through here. If I have a compacted soil, what's going to happen? First of all, can I get roots through a compacted soil? No. And it's going to be very wet there, and they're soluble. What happens to soluble nutrients? They flow with the water, and they go out the system. Doesn't help you. You've got to have aerated systems first, have good soil structure, and then you can really get your yields, okay? That's what we're looking at. We're going to skip a few things. Come on, now let's go. Oh, well, there it is. Here's just what we've got. We've got about half and half bacteria and fungus in the soil. Even though there's only 100 million fungus, that's equal to about 50 billion bacteria, okay? Here's the problem. Uh, we've got all these different groups out there, and we need these. Why do we need the mites, the millipedes, and the centipedes? And here's something that we're really kind of messing up a little bit. How many of you guys use insecticides? How many of you guys, okay. How many of you guys use seed treatments? Everybody's using seed treatments, so you're all using insecticides. I hate to tell you, 95%. Unfortunately, what happens is we're kind of killing off the springtails, the mites, the millipedes and all those other ones. Why are they so important? Because those are the ones that break down the carbon so your bacteria and your fungus can break it up. There's a couple things. If you're not getting your residue to break up, you probably have compaction. You probably have too wet soil. But if you're using the insecticides, the seed treatments, overdoing them, what will happen is you'll have a lot less of the millipedes to break them up. And you'll also have a lot more bacteria and you need fungus. You need fungus, temperature, and moisture to break up your residue. And along with that, you need all these other things to help break it into chunks so they can get their mouths around it to break it down. So if you're having trouble with your residue, think about what you're doing there. Uh, and also, we're finding out that those neonicotinoids are actually contributing to more slugs. These crabidae beetles, the black beetles, a lot of these beetle larvae that are out there, they eat their weight in weed seed and slug eggs on a daily basis, okay? So what you want to do is 
the, the black beetles only lay about 10 to 20 eggs per year. Okay, a slug will lay 500. If you get rid of all the beetles and have very low beetle population, it don't take very long for those slugs. Good news, possibly, if it got cold enough this year, guys, the slugs will recycle about every two to five years. Okay, if it got cold enough and the temperature, uh, your soil froze deep enough and the water table came up, you'll kill a lot of slugs. What you'll do is you'll reset the clock and they'll start to build over the next two to five years. We've had about six years now. I'm hoping it got cold enough this year. In order for it to be cold enough, you can't have a lot of residue. But you had a lot of cover crops out there and it was very thick. You may not got that deep, but that will kind of help. And again, I have some fact sheets on that. If you guys are having problems, give me a call. Okay? Earthworms. What do they do? Just look at this number. These things are huge. This is what those earthworms do. They improve your structure stability by 13 times. They uh, increase your calcium by four and a half. Exchangeable uh, uh, potassium by three times. Your soluble phosphorus by almost three, two and a half to three, and your total nitrogen almost two and a half to three times. Okay, so that's why these earthworms. If you're having problems with earthworms, uh, eat, getting your seed that's broadcasted, the best thing you can do is try to put out an early soybean or early corn, get your cover crop established with a drill, plant it, get it below the ground, and then the earthworms will leave it alone. Once you get enough food out there and you feed them, uh, then you'll have less problem with it. But you always got to be thinking, how can I get more biomass for them to, them to eat? If you're running out of biomass and you have no residue on your surface, you're going to have a very hard time. You've got to get ahead of the ball game some, somehow and get a little bit more residue out there for them to decompose, okay? And then you'll have less problems with them going after the seed. All right, uh, I'm going to skip some of this. This is why we don't like the bacteria too much. They're only 20 to 30 percent efficient. They're all important, don't get me wrong. But if we overdo the bacteria, we're going to have less carbon in our soil. These are the fungi they put in 40 to 55 percent. So that's how we're going to build our carbon. They also give off something called glomalion. And glomalion is what causes your soil to crumble. Okay, so that's what you want. We'll talk about this a little bit more later. I'm going to skip a little bit of this. Just want to make sure I cover all the good points. This is kind of what they look like. Um, that actually is just a total mass of mycorrhizae. That's probably at least 100, maybe 1,000 different filaments. These things are so, so tiny in the soil. This is what a root hair looks like, so that is brown. They tend to be either white or yellow. If you dig in the soil and you see some of these white little rope-like kind of thread-like things, uh, you better look close because they'll disappear in about five or ten minutes. Once they're exposed to oxygen, you won't be able to find them back. But why are they so, so important? Because they're going to give you six times more phosphorus. Over-fertilizing for phosphorus causes the mycorrhizal fungi to go down. We have a lot of phosphorus in our soils, guys. We could probably make better use of it. Matter of fact, I can probably say this. If you've been regularly fertilizing for phosphorus, chances are you could cut back on your phosphorus in a high year like this and you won't see a yield. 90%, 80 to 90% of the phosphorus when it's applied is tied up in the soil. Only about 10 to 20 percent of it actually gets into the plant root that year. Okay, so you probably have a huge bank of phosphorus out there. If you need to cut costs, phosphorus is probably one of the easiest ways. If I was going to put phosphorus on, I'd put it on with my row starter. I would not be broadcasting it. I'd just put some on with the row, and that's probably all you need. Realizing though, if you get too much phosphorus on the row, you're going to decrease your mycorrhizal. That plant is going to feed the mycorrhizae as long as that mycorrhizae brings phosphorus back. So if I can get it for free, I'm just like them. I'm too cheap to pay for it. And so they won't develop those networks. And then what happens? About pollination time, all of a sudden that plant says, I need more phosphorus. It takes time to develop this relationship. By then it's hurt your yield. So realize that once you get into a soil health 
uh, system and you start getting those microbes going there, we regularly are cutting back on our phosphorus because we don't need as much. We're getting it from these mycorrhizae. Okay, and this just shows you the glomalion. These are those roots uh, that are going through there. They give off, uh, they got these uh, um, mycorrhizae attached to it. That glomalion's in the green. Those are the glues that cause your soil to stick together. Okay, we're going to skip this. Last two slides and I'm done. Just remember this carbon to nitrogen <coughs> ratio is so important. This is just the same in the rumen of a cow as what it is in the soil. If I were to feed alfalfa to a cow, what happens? It has a low carbon to nitrogen ratio, and that's this upper graph, okay? They can get the nitrogen out, and uh, they can form proteins with it. If I get that carbon to nitrogen ratio too high, if I were to feed a cow oat straw or wheat straw, what happens? What happens is, in order to decompose that, they're sucking nitrogen out of the soil or out of that cow's body, which isn't helping the cow, and eventually you get it back, but it can be several weeks later. So think about how we can use that with our cover crop. Soybeans, they make their own nitrogen. Cereal rye is a great crop. High carbon to nitrogen ratio. You're getting some nitrogen from the soybeans. The, the cereal rye is going to help supply phosphorus. Grasses supply phosphorus to your legumes. Your legumes are going to supply nitrogen to your grasses. Okay, and so what happens is this works real well with cereal rye, and uh, the soybeans do great. Do I want to put cereal rye in front of corn? Two grasses, they both like nitrogen. The answer is you're better off putting the legume or a radish or something like that. Just don't ever put more than about uh, two pounds of radish because then we'll get a water quality problem. Those radishes, if they get really big, if you put them out, they get pretty deep in the soil. Then what happens when it gets cold? Turn to elephant snot, okay? Just go right down. When it rains, it goes right out the tile, and we get the highest phosphorus concentrations in Lake Erie and in these creeks that you've ever seen. How do you, how do you help with that problem? Just add grass, and when this thing starts to decompose, the grass roots will now start to flourish. They'll suck up that nitrogen, suck up that phosphorus. As long as you keep the rate low enough, you'll be all right. Every pound of radish has, uh, what is it, close to 40,000 seeds. So you really, if you do two seeds per square foot, that should be enough. And it really don't matter the size. The small one's just as good as a real big one, okay? And you don't really have to worry about uh, that ground would be so mellow there. You don't have to worry about your corn going down to China. We've already studied that. It's fine. <laughs> it's a little warmer. There's a lot of nutrients there. The corn really likes the radish. And it'll do just fine. You plant right over the top of it, right beside it, even right in the middle between radishes, and you're fine. Okay? Last thing. Carbon to nitrogen ratio, keep it in that 20. If you get it above 20, you're going to tie up your nitrogen. If it's below 20, it's going to be released. Typical C to N ratio in the soil is 10 to 12. Good news, you generally have nitrogen available. But if I add a high cover crop, or something like sawdust that has an 80 to 100 to 1, it's going to tie up your nitrogen. Now it'll come available. A lot of guys that put that cereal rye out said, oh, it just stunned my corn, it looked terrible. But then when you go and look at that corn in August and September, too late to do any good, what color is it? It's dark blue. Okay, it's dark green because the nitrogen's released at the wrong time. So that's what we're trying to learn with that. This just shows you what we want to do. We want those good ones. This is good for soybeans. We want things that are higher in carbon. For corn, you want things that are a little bit lower, okay? And, and th that's what's good for the corn, and that will help you, okay? And I think with that, I'm going to call it quits because we're already quarter after. And we'll talk a little bit more about the compaction and some other things. If you guys have any questions at lunchtime, I'll try to answer them then. And I think we have an answer uh, session after much too. Woo! I told you I could talk. If anybody wants a card, I've got them up here, so uh, I am doing some consulting and a few other things. Alright, well, thank you. Jim. One more hand for him. Yes.